So uh, the next we have uh, is uh, Natalie Elphick, uh, OBE member of parliament, um, who is going to uh, give us uh, an overview of Web3 uh, policy landscape. Um, Natalie is also uh, the chair of UK All Party Parliamentary Group on Blockchain Technologies. Uh, it's great to have you with us, Natalie. Um, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie Alvik, and I'm a UK Member of Parliament, and I'm pleased to join you in the Metaverse today, and that the United Kingdom is the host country for today's summit. As the Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Blockchain Technologies in the UK Parliament, I'm delighted to be making this keynote speech today on the promise of Web3 in the context of innovation policy making. Making policy implementing legislation is often reactive, responding to dangers, risks, or harm to the public or a nation state. Some examples are dangerous dogs, bad employers, or the rise of criminal gangs and terrorists using the internet, social media platforms, or encrypted applications to communicate and network. However, policy can be about creating and supporting opportunities for the new, for innovation, and for change. And sometimes policies to prevent harm or to affect change need to be transnational. Addressing climate change is one example, and Web3 is another. Web3 economies, by their very nature, are often transnational global ecosystems. Web3 represents a paradigm shift that reimagines the very fabric of the internet. At its core, Web3 is about decentralization, empowerment, and the restoration of ownership and control to individuals. This paradigm is made possible by blockchain technologies, which introduce transparency, immutability, and can improve trust in a digital society. But they also bring people together around the globe who work in different jurisdictions with different laws, corporate structures, and different standards, and that does present real challenges to policymakers. Let's take decentralized autonomous organizations. By way of an example, a DAO founded by developers in Singapore, managed by a group of DAO voters based in 50 different countries, and used by a community of users who will be based all around the globe. How do policymakers, whose regulations and policies must be designed reflecting their political national context and domestic priorities ensure that what they're doing is effective in a transnational context. Let's take decentralized finance with its permissionless global financial infrastructures. These pose their own unique challenges and opportunities for regulators and policy makers. Ensuring transparency, auditability and accountability in these ecosystems is paramount. Let's take NFT. Now the momentum is building and use cases involving tokenization of real world physical assets are emerging faster than ever before. It is predicted that the market for tokenized assets could reach $16 trillion by 2030. It is unquestionable that our world is being tokenized. From real estate to precious metal metals, from arts and collectibles to education credentials, from stocks and bonds to carbon credits and energy tokens. The physical assets are getting tokenized and this trend will only grow from here. Earlier this year, the British Blockchain Association responded to the government treasury call for the consultation on how non-fungible tokens should be treated and how we can make smart contracts much smarter and practically viable. So let's take Web3 governance, and that includes both on-chain governance and audit of smart contracts, as well as off-chain evaluation of blockchain service providers. We can say that in blockchain we trust, but how do we establish trust in the individuals and companies 
that provide blockchain applications and products. Regulation and effective policies can certainly help to mitigate some of the risks, but they cannot eliminate them entirely. FTX is an example of that. So we have to devise regulations and policies that can be safe for citizens, fit for purpose, and pro-innovation within their own context, be that NFTs, DAOs, DeFi, Metaverse, and other decentralized applications. And it also needs to address the issues that arise around intellectual property, ownership, taxation, and the legal position of these entities. Policymakers do have a vital role in deciding where those risks and responsibilities sit. Now, when it comes to policymaking for the Web3 economy in the United Kingdom, I believe there are some key national priorities. I'm going to outline some of these priorities briefly in my keynote today, as well as share an overview of the future direction in the context of the UK economy. The principles here are also broadly applicable to other blockchain economies. First, jobs, skills, and growth. Blockchain and Web3 are some of the most sought after and well-paid skills. But Britain is lagging competitors in securing blockchain-related jobs, including Germany, the United States, and France, as well as the Netherlands, Spain, and India. In the first quarter of 2023, out of a total of around 90,000 jobs globally, the UK ranked in number 12, securing only about 2,000 of these. The talent pool in Web3 is global, and every country is bidding for the same talent. And it's not just in technical skills. It's also educators, lawyers, public relations officers, community managers, metaverse safety moderators, blockchain ethics advisors, and professionalism advocates, and many more, some jobs which didn't even exist a few years ago. And that emerging talent pool must be inclusive. For cutting edge technology, it has some prehistoric diversity and inclusivity figures. The latest JBBA research showed that only 11% of DAO members and voters were female. Another study showed that only 6% of C-suite executives of blockchain and Web3 firms are women. So the first UK national priority in Web3 industry growth and workforce planning. And part of that is about making the UK an attractive hub for Web3 founders, EOs, developers, programmers, and companies working here who can make a positive contribution to the UK economy. I believe that we must penalize bad actors, and it's equally important to reward good actors. They should be supported, facilitated, hired, and funded so they can help grow the economy. Web3 is global. So if we make and apply laws that stifle innovation, put unnecessary restrictions in place, business will go elsewhere. I was encouraged to see some blockchain and Web3 firms have made the UK their second home, and many more are planning to relocate here. Jurisdictions that are pro-innovation and have a clear regulatory and policy stance will eventually attract businesses and generate revenue that will help to grow a country's economy. A second priority is to make Britain smart as well as great. The UK has the potential to become a blockchain-enabled smart country for digital government, citizens, and public services. Blockchain-based systems can reduce costs and increase transparency in government and public sector processes. Self-executing algorithms can streamline inoperability, increase trust and efficiency in online civil systems. Governments around the globe have been exploring how blockchain could be utilized to streamline and support transparency, efficiency and trust in public services. These have included for land registration in Georgia, United Kingdom, Sweden, for digital identity management in Switzerland, Estonia and Luxembourg, for immigration and border control in Finland, taxation records in China, pension infrastructure in the Netherlands, and for logistics and transportation in India. Which takes me to my third national priority, taking forward the National Blockchain Roadmap. Published in 2021, 
UK National Blockchain Roadmap sets out an ambition to build a DLT-based digital nation and put forward various recommendations to construct the key components of the UK's blockchain economy. And I'm very pleased that Lord Holmes of Richmond, who has been instrumental in the development of this important work, is able to join today's summit. Uh, and, and that's extremely welcome. So far, less than a dozen countries around the world have published their national blockchain roadmap. It's vital to learn from other jurisdictions and to establish forums such as this one, meet, discuss and debate joint challenges in the Web3 space. Thinking globally and acting locally, blockchain can support UN SDGs, Net Zero, climate mitigation efforts, industry symbiosis networks, and other emerging blockchain use cases. And while everyone is talking about WorldCoin and iScans, some people don't know that it was the United Nations World Food Program in 2016, almost seven years ago, that used iris scans to provide not tokens, but food and grocery to Syrian refugees in Jordanian camps. Blockchain enabled digital identity as a step forward towards an inclusive global economy. So moving on to supply chains, trade and e-commerce and how we build and support innovation and excellence. What we learned from TradeLens is that while the blockchain platform managed to track almost 4 billion events, published over 36 million documents and processed over 70 million containers, there have been challenges around effectively effective industry cooperation. Quadruple Helix blockchain innovation ecosystems must work together to ensure alignment of incentives and make DLT consortia commercially viable. That means looking collaboratively and openly at what has worked for enterprise blockchains and also what hasn't, looking in the private space and in public blockchains too. And why it hasn't, this is important. It's important we share that expertise and knowledge to help with resource allocation and policy considerations. Now that doesn't always happen. The JBBA research uh, recently showed that blockchain companies do not always publish their monitoring, research, evaluation and learning outcomes. If they did, that would mean that we would, can, we would not be wasting precious resource and we would not keep experimenting again and again until the lessons are learned. In 2018, there were 57 universities on the GBBA mailing list. Now there are more than 800 universities on that list and it's growing. These are institutions directly involved in blockchain research and offering postgraduate modules or courses in blockchain related technology. Knowledge networks enable the production of high quality peer reviewed data, which in turn helps to direct precious resources to blockchain programs that are backed by scientific evidence. That's the same with the evaluation, appraisal and audit of blockchain ecosystems. It's crucial that we spend resources on what provides the best value for taxpayer money and follow the fundamentals of evidence-based blockchain. So for every £100 invested in blockchain projects, an amount, say for illustration of £2, must be spent on making sure that the other £98 actually works. To conclude, Building communities, ecosystems, and regulatory infrastructures can take time and patience. The academics may have the scientific foundations that the industry does not have. Enterprise may have the latest industry data that the policymakers don't have access to. Public and end users may offer valuable insights to barriers to blockchain adoption. And policymakers or policymakers have to see how that all works together within the current political and legal constraints, as well as with a view to a long-term vision for innovation change and growth. It requires all stakeholders to collaborate and play their constructive role in building progressive and resilient blockchain ecosystems that will benefit domestic and global citizens now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. That was an excellent keynote. Thank you so much for your time.